forum. Uh, I'm David Pierre Goldberg, the director of the PC Humanities Research Institute, the host organization for this. It's an enormous pleasure to welcome um, Philip Schmidt uh, to talk to us today. Uh, Philip, uh, most of you will know as the co founder and now director of the Peer to Peer University. Uh, he uh, lives in Cape Town, of all places, my hometown. So mm -hmm. Cool to, to know that and know you from it. Um, and uh, he has uh, worked on education and development issues in Africa. He has worked in the past for Accenture in France. Uh, he's a computer scientist by training um, and uh, has been part of the UN University of America program. Uh, has worked for the University of the Western Cape in uh, Cape Town and uh, setting up um, programs for them uh, and uh, is involved uh, with uh, uh, the MacArthur Foundation Initiative in Digital Media and Learning uh, along with us, deep involved in conversations but, uh, and uh, uh, the Mozilla Foundation, the Firefox folks, uh, really designing a, a badging system for certifying community-based uh, knowledge formation. Um, and he's here to talk to us today about KDK University. So please join me in welcoming Philip. There will be comments on his talks by um, Gary Matkin, who is the Dean of Continuing Education here at UC Irvine. Gary is here, it's a great pleasure to have him here. And Bill Maurer, who is the director of the Institute for Money, Technology, uh, and Financial Inclusion. I'm, I'm just getting it right. Yeah. <laughs> so, and a colleague of ours in the community. So, um, welcome, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, thanks for inviting me, uh, David. Because without UC Irvine, uh, Peer to Peer University might, might still exist, but it wouldn't have gotten to where it is as quickly. And we've had a long uh, relationship uh, with Gary and Larry in the open courseware uh, work who kind of helped us get started and incubated the project actually at some point, um, when it was just an idea that a few uh, people had who were all over the world and didn't quite know what was going to happen um, with this idea. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, kind of the context in which PDP University uh, was became, became an idea first and then went from an idea to a project. Um, some of the changes that are that are happening in the world of higher education that, that we are seeing, and then talk a little bit about what PDP University actually is and how it works and who's involved and how the courses work, and then. Um, mention a few areas that we are really interested in at the moment, including badges and certification, but almost more like uh, questions, kind of presenting you with the thoughts that we have, and then I'm hoping that we can have a conversation about that more than uh, me kind of just talking about uh, peer to university. Um, so I think the, the fundamental kind of situation that I and the people who started peer to university uh, saw was that there was this, there's this amazing moment of opportunity right now in, in higher education. Um, and that, the, that opportunity is a mix of, of three things. It's really, it brings together the, the formal education environment uh, with the open web, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means in my, in my head, and the informal learning environment. That we now have a chance to actually bring those together in a much more coherent way, uh, uh, leverage the strengths that the different pieces have, um, and really see some pretty, uh, I think, amazing changes in, in how higher education is working. Um, so I think the, the current model, uh, I mean, I, I've worked in a university uh, in Cape Town where, where probably the situation is very different from UCI, but I do believe that there are some similarities uh, that kind of resonate in both places. And, and I think that the, we have uh, kind of reason to believe that there are certain things that are fundamentally wrong with the model of higher education that we, as we have practiced it in, let's say, the last hundred years, maybe 
kind of building on the Humboldt University and then the, the kind of more the driver of, in, of industrial development and the kind of strategic um, role that the university has played in workplace, uh, workforce development, etc. And, and I think the reason why we're a little bit stuck is because of this concept of the iron triangle. Um, the model that we have now, kind of, it's difficult to move any of these three pieces without affecting the other two. So if we are trying to bring down cost, um, it affects quality and access generally. If we try to increase access, the, the other two are affected. And we're kind of stuck where we're, we're trying to make all of them more access at lower cost and higher quality, and it doesn't quite work. And I think it's for structural reasons that that doesn't quite work. Um, I think it's obvious that if we look at the demand for higher education, I mean, UC Irvine is a great example with the, the huge influx of foreign students. Um, I think it's obvious that if we look at Asia and South America, the, the number of young people who are going to be looking for higher education opportunities in the next 10 or 20 years, there's no way that we can build enough uh, brick and mortar universities and, and not even um, supply them with educational opportunities using distance learning because there simply aren't enough uh, teachers in, in the way that the current model works to teach all these, all these students. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, the quality aspect here, which is related to learning. <coughs> um, and, and then I'll come back to that later. I think cost and access are, are um, pretty self-explanatory. So the, talking about the quality aspect, it, it's someone actually at the DML conference used this metaphor, and I thought it was quite interesting. He, he said, um, the way we think about education is like the that we're preparing for hibernation, like we have a bear who's preparing for hibernation. We try to eat as much as possible in a, in a really short, defined period of time, and then we, we kind of don't eat for a really long time. So we go to university and we have to cram all this knowledge into our heads, and then we go out into the world, we work for you know, 10 or 20 years, and it's, it's disconnected, and it just, I mean, that's, I think in today's world, that's just um, that's first of all it's changing, and, and second of all, people are really struggling. But even if I look, I mean, I study computer science. There's almost nothing I learned in terms of technical skills in my uh, university um, uh, experience that is still relevant today. So there are certain practices of working in collaboration and kind of you know, an approach to being a computer scientist that's still very valid. But a lot of the things I have to constantly uh, upgrade. Um, and then secondly, still in the quality or learning space, um, there's, I think we know that new skills are needed. Some people call them 21st century skills, other people speak more about digital literacy. Um, but the way we are teaching is still very much stuck in a, in a structure where people are not encouraged to collaborate with each other. Uh, you know, the, the lectures are, it's a very rigid lecture uh, structure where People are expected to sit in a chair for 15 minutes and listen to someone talk largely. And, and uh, you know, the, the situation in a place like UC Irvine might be different, where more people have access to small seminars and more interactive experiences, but that is an absolute luxury for the majority of people in higher education. So, um, you know, we mustn't forget that most people, uh, you know, sit in row 18 of some lecture hall listening to someone speak in the front. And um, taking that kind of learning experience where there's a lot of new ways that people learn that is not reflected in the institution to the certification, I think the same is true for certification. We still have the same kind of degree that we've had uh, for decades, uh, which at best, I would argue, gives some implied uh, statement about someone's abilities because it is so, it is such a, uh, a summary, right? So I get one piece of paper that tells, is supposed to tell you about my uh, at least four year long experience of learning and, and achievements and my abilities. And the, the best I think we do in most cases, we kind of associate it with the brand of the university and we just assume, okay, well, it's, well, he's an Oxford man, but often we get it wrong and the Oxford brand actually is you know, not exactly what we expected, or maybe the Oxford brand isn't enough. It's easy to pick on a UK institution here because I'm in the US. Um, if I was there, I would do it the other way around. But, um, <laughs> so I think that like, 
basically, I think the certification is also still stuck in this old model. And since I think it's useful to look at uh, what has changed. Uh, and the changes, I would argue, are dramatic, uh, not so much in higher education, but outside of higher education, and then look at what are the opportunities that that creates. So one is uh, content is free. Um, the, the digitization of, of content, there's a, a downwards push towards free that is almost impossible to resist. People are, have tried all kinds of business models to deal with open and free content. The, the reality is once it's out of the box, it's very difficult to put it back into the box. And I think the textbook publishers are the latest industry that is experiencing that at the moment. And then secondly, we've seen that people are able to self-organize in incredibly sophisticated ways to create uh, amazing uh, knowledge products. So Wikipedia is one example, open source software, there are many dozens of other examples in the arts, in science, where uh, these online communities seemingly unregulated, they actually are highly regulated, but the regulation comes from within more than uh, is pre-designed from outside. Um, people work together, they, spend a, they put in a lot of time, they put in a lot of expertise, they often outperform the, the incumbents, so Wikipedia quality in, in some areas outperforms Encyclopedia Britannica, or at least as uh, I think the Nature Study concluded that they are equally incorrect uh, in, in most fields. And so we have this, we, we see this incredible um, uh, collaborative spirit that's happening online, uh, and the kind of the raw materials of education, which I would say are content, are becoming free. I'm kind of going to just use two examples for that. So one is uh, uh, UC Irvine has an open course where I sort of picked the MIT video because I wasn't sure which video Larry wanted me to show. But the amazing thing is not that this video is available online. The amazing thing is that, and this is an old screenshot, that 390,000 people have, have viewed this. Um, to reach 390,000 individuals as a, a lecturer is, was impossible 10 years ago. Um, and now, you, you know, uploading it to a, a, a website, there's no charge, hundreds of thousands of people can access it. And what's, what's interesting, I think, about these hundreds of thousands of people, they are all over the world. So this is, a, this is actually from, from UCI's open courseware uh, experience that uh, learners from 159 countries access these materials. At the same time, 25% of the people coming to the site are from California. So you have this really interesting mix of people, very strong local interest, but also kind of diffusion, global diffusion, where there are all these people who, who had no way of getting these materials before, who now, who obviously have a demand for them. Um, and in terms of the access, so this is more, I guess, about my, where I, where I live, but maybe equally applicable to, to other parts of the world. Um, this was in 2010, and this is in kind of forecast for 2012. Uh, and I should have taken one before, where basically there was almost nothing for you know, everything leading up to 2010. So the, the amount of access, uh, yeah, by the way, this is the internet access coming into, into the countries in Africa. Um, so the amount of access is increasing so rapidly right now that very soon broadband internet access will be affordable in, in, in large parts, at least all the coastal uh, nations of, uh, of Africa. So the, the result of this is that we now have uh, the, the world's greatest educational resources and content available free of charge online so that everyone can reach them, and millions of other people that we could potentially learn with uh, using those materials. So the, the current model is broken, it's how we how it started, What's nice now is that everyone can actually help to fix the situation, right? So it's not just the innovation doesn't actually come from the institutions, but it can come from other places. And, and I think that is the, the fundamentally the story of peer to peer university, where we, we saw there was all this content on the internet, but there was a disconnect between the content and, the, and making use of it and, and turning it into learning and, and turning it into experiences that would help people advance in their lives, in their careers, uh, or maybe help them get into academic opportunities that weren't available to them before. Um, so Peer to University has been around for you know, a little more than a year. It's really kind of centered on the two pillars of open content and the open social web. So bringing people together, 
giving them access to content and uh, creating learning opportunities. It's completely uh, free of charge, anyone can get involved. Uh, the courses are all run by volunteers. Um, a course in our model is usually a six week long kind of set of challenges that people work through, but there's huge, I mean if people want to do eight weeks or four weeks, it's completely open to that, so there's you have flexibility. Um, the learning model is fundamentally different, um, or at least in principle, uh, because that could be an interesting insight I should come back to. So the, the structure is really peer learning, where the role of the lecturer or professor is minimal, really more as a facilitator who helps people learn, but not someone who is the content expert. Um, and uh, I think right now that is still more a vision than a reality. Because for a number of reasons. One is that people are just not used to this, right? so they kind of don't trust it. Uh, and only people who've experienced it, and often they've experienced it in great institutions like UCI, uh, kind of have made that mental switch where they go, yeah, well, actually, the <coughs> I all these things with my fellow students, not, not necessarily from the professor. And so then they have the confidence to kind of take that step. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the principle is very much focused on peer learning, putting study groups together, rather than having someone uh, teach those groups. Um, we've got, this is kind of a, I guess, to, to highlight the fact that there is demand. We've, we've done zero uh, marketing, uh, so it's all word of mouth and kind of people thinking it up online and using Twitter and, and Facebook to, to get the word out. Uh, we have about uh, 10,000 registered users on the site. Uh, we ran uh, 54, I think it is, uh, courses in started, which started in January. More than 3,000 people signed up for them, 2,200 were accepted into them, and 1,400 enrolled. Um, and I'm using kind of activity in week two as the enrollment um, uh, to, to, to determine if someone actually enrolled. Um, and we've, we've grown every round, we've doubled so far, and so we're, we're planning to do that at least for one more year. Uh, which means double the number of people and the number of courses every three months right now. Um, and we also have, we've had courses in three languages. English is by far the most popular language, but uh, there are, is a strong Spanish community in Latin America. Uh, there, there was a very strong Brazilian community that quite dominated. Um, but so yeah, courses in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, this is a kind of a special a project within peer -peer University. It's a partnership with Mozilla uh, where we try to use the peer to peer model to apply it to web developer training specifically. So, peer to peer University, as a overall, is you can run any course that you want to run there. Uh, and I'll, I'll give two or three examples later. Um, School of Webcraft is much more focused on one particular area. Um, it, it has the, the strong partner in Mozilla. Uh, who give uh, content expertise, who bring a community of web developers, and who will also be certifying some of the um, achievements that people make in, in these courses. Um, and, and so maybe to kind of lead into what are some of the use cases, <coughs> why are people running these courses, why are, what's the interest uh, in the kid university, as, and as much as we know this, right, we, we haven't been very good at collecting data on, on people who come to come to us and, and what they're doing. Um, but the web, in the web development field, it's very, uh, it was a very strong response that people basically said, well, there isn't really a great place to become a web developer. Uh, like, I can go on the internet and I can tr try to find my way and find these communities and I can submit problems and maybe someone will help me, but there isn't really a community for people learning web development. And uh, the alternatives that you had were you could go to university and study computer science, where web development is a really small piece of you know, all these other things you would be learning. And if you just want to be a web developer, you're, you're going to learn a lot of things that you, you're not interested in. Or you could go into the, the private training uh, fields, where often the programs are very proprietary, uh, not in line with the open technologies that actually drive the web. Uh, which are the most innovative things, like things like HTML5, which is the, the next version of HTML, which is completely open. Um, so those things, there wasn't really a space for these people, and we've definitely had that kind of feedback that confirmed uh, that there was a gap, and, and why people are coming to School of Web Crowd. Um, two other examples of, of why people would run a course with P2PU and what they get out of it. 
Uh, Andrew Renz is a lawyer from South Africa. He, um, he spent a lot of time advising people in education on licensing issues. So people had questions about, uh, fair, I think it's fair use here, it's fair dealings in South Africa. How many pages can I copy? Uh, if it's under Creative Commons license, what does it mean? How do I license it? And so he was bogged down with questions and he, he was one of the very few people in South Africa who had this knowledge. So he designed a course, um, Copyright for Educators, because he hoped that he would have to do less of, that, of the work if he could make people learn it themselves. Didn't quite turn out that way in the first uh, iteration, but uh, so, but he, his course is actually great because it was designed very aggressively to not have an instructor. And even the last assignment is to design an assignment for the next round of courses coming in so that he wouldn't even have to come up with new assignments. Um, so for him it was kind of part of what he was doing anyway. He had the expertise to design the basic structure. He did want to teach the course. And this course has now uh, had various iterations, it's grown into country specific uh, courses, so we've had a course for South Africa, UK, uh, US, we're going to have Canada next, Australia, um, we now have courses specifically on, copy, uh, on Creative Commons, so not just copyright, but open licensing, so he kind of started this ball road and people got involved, they started running more courses, and, and, um, and so that, that's I think one, one, one approach to running the course. This is Jane. She uh, studied creative writing uh, in Berkeley, actually, and then took a job that kind of took her away from her writing career. And she always had, had in her mind that she wanted to go back and, and write again. And so she ran a course on creative nonfiction writing, which is a very unusual uh, subject, apparently. And it was a way for her to kind of reconnect with her passion uh, that gave her some structure and made her kind of work through some examples and also work with other people and see, kind of look at their work and kind of helped her come back to something she was interested in but wasn't quite sure if it was going to be a career for her at any point but gave her a little bit of structure to come back. So I think we have lots of people at Kyoto University who fall in this category who just have some expertise but really just want a reason to go back to something that they've started working on. Um, so I think that's all kind of I want to say as a general introduction to how Kipling University works and, and what it does and why people get involved. Um, and then if like we can obviously come back to any any specifics. I want to just briefly talk about four issues that we've kind of been, I guess, thinking a lot about through this experience, just learning in the process. I mean the, the one thing I didn't say which I think is obvious, but uh, that this has been just a huge experiment. Uh, when we started this, uh, it was just a bunch of people who thought, well, you know, let's see what happens. And then uh, the, the response was, has been overwhelming actually at every stage. And it took on a life of, of its own in, in some way. Uh, to, to kind of, now it has this momentum, it's been incorporated in California as a 501c3. You know, there's some grant funding to keep it going. We're working with all these partners. And so, uh, it, I don't think a year from now, a year ago, or maybe a year and a half ago, the people who started it really, were really sure that that was going to happen. Um, so there's been a lot of experimentation left and right, and we kind of, when, when the choice is between structure and experimentation, we've always done with experimentation. And that's sometimes difficult for the user, but I think it's interesting for, for everyone else, because we also share everything that goes wrong. Um, so there are four kind of areas where we've done a lot of we've done a lot of thinking and kind of just trying to figure things out um, that I want to just briefly mention. One is learning, obviously. So you know there is there is this idea that uh, a lot of the learning that that is most useful or very useful today happens outside of institutions where uh, we the institutions aren't really following the people to the places where they are learning. Uh, you know. The web development is maybe uh, kind of an extreme example, uh, but I think the same is true in many other places where people form interest communities. Um, they, you know, go back to things they were interested in many years after they formally studied them. They need to upskill to stay relevant in their work, um, and a lot of those things <coughs> don't fit into the structures that we have created as institutions, um, or they're simply too expensive and people, you know, don't have access to them. So. Uh, th there is a kind of an aggressive 
uh, attempt here to create new ways of lifelong peer learning. Um, and what, what's been interesting for me to see is how much this has been driven by curiosity and kind of trying to solve problems. Uh, and I think that's inspiring for institutions because um, the kind of the, the flip side of this way, you know, you're trying to teach someone some, something and they're clearly not interested. It's just such a frustrating experience. Um, and, and it's so hard to, to sometimes create that sense of curiosity. But it's amazing to see how much of that actually is out there and how, how strong the demand is for, from people you know, to participate in these communities. So I think there's a lot of energy that can be harnessed by the institutions um, that kind of happens outside of institutions today. Um, secondly, we have a lot of questions around governance because P2P University is almost entirely run by volunteers. Um, there are some people who get paid, but the decision making is extremely open and transparent. So even though I have the title of director, I have to be very careful what decisions I take and who I consult and how I communicate them. Because at the end of the day, if I do too many things that the community doesn't like, there's no more project. I, I can't pay people to, to do Pitt University. Um, so it's kind of this give and take, right? The community does look for some level of leadership and people to do some things that the community doesn't want to do necessarily. Um, but we have to be careful in how we involve the community in those, in those discussions. Um, so, and so I guess one kind of challenge is, you know, how do you grow this, which is, you know, like a really <coughs> early stage community to something like this, which is the Mozilla uh, Summit, which is an annual gathering of the core Mozillians. Um, and how do you still make decisions with, you know, people like this? I think you can see that they're they're quite I'm, they're not uh, they don't fall into the typical corporate hierarchy structure model. Um, you know how do you how do you harness these open communities in a way that you can still stay on track as a project? You don't get completely distracted, but you build these new uh, kind of governance models um, as you go along. Uh, the next question is, is and this is this always comes up. Well, how do you how do you ensure quality? Um, and, uh, and usually people mean quality of courses, like how do you make sure that the courses that you, you have aren't you know, horrible. Uh, and, and I think there are two approaches to quality on the web uh, that we've seen. One is um, Yahoo, Yahoo, I'm not never sure how to pronounce it, but the, the left one, um, which is there's this mess and we're going to categorize it so that for the user it becomes uh, manageable. And then there's, well, obviously the other approach, which is there's this mess, great, we'll let it self-organize. We'll give the user some tools, they can make sense of it, but uh, we don't try to categorize it. We don't try to hire people to categorize it. And so um, I think initially there has to be a transition from left to right here, because obviously as long as we have very few courses that we've only run them a few times, we don't have a lot of data that we can offer to the user. We, we can't tell them this course has run three times, everyone's dropped out every time, people really hated the experience. Um, but as we have more courses and as we have a larger community, I think we will be able to, to shift that quality review from the kind of the entry point to the to the user. So I think at some point Peter Peter University is going to have thousands of courses of which a good number are going to be absolutely crap. But we will be able to, to give the users the information about these courses that they need to not do them. So rather than me going through and saying, well, we're not going to do this course because it's crap, I'm, I'm going to tell the user, well, either this course has never run before, so you know, have a look at the materials and see who's running it to make, make up your mind. Or we, I can say, this has run before, everyone dropped out, people said bad things about it. You know, you are, if you want to take it, great. But probably it's not going to be a great experience. So, so that's, I think our approach to quality is going to have to move to that, to that level, but obviously that's completely different than, than the way that institutions deal with quality today, where you want to make sure that every course in your university is great. Um, so it doesn't always work, I mean, let's be honest. Um, so, and the last point I think is certification, which is kind of the, really the not that holds it all together, uh, I think, at the moment. Um, 
So we don't, P2P University offers no certification at, the, at this point, and we will never be an accredited uh, university uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure that the people who participate can have recognition for their achievements that is appropriate to what they want to do. So if I'm a web developer and I want to get a job, we are going to create some form of recognition for you that helps you get a job. If you want to take a refresher course before you enter a master's degree, we're going to try to help you transfer the, what you've done in Peer to University into the institution that you're applying to so that they maybe give you credit and free credit for, for that one course. Um, and if you just want to do it because you want to do it and you want to put on your blog that you've done this course, then we will help you, we'll help you do that. So there are kind of two areas that that falls into that we're experimenting with. Um, one is actually with UCI, where we've been talking uh, for a while. It's still very conceptual, but the idea would be that uh, for continuing professional education credits, we would link kind of massive online courses where people self-organize and peer learn with assessments and certification that is handled uh, at UCI. So the, the quality control kind of comes at the end. The institution makes sure that people have the skills that they need. But the, the learning to some degree is outsourced to the open web, uh, and you let you know you let people um, handle that how, however they, they, uh, that makes most sense to them. And then the, the second area, which is I think more, I guess, a little more experimental and kind of harder to get your head around, is uh, well, how do we create com complementary certification that makes sense on the web? And uh, David mentioned badges. That's kind of what the term we've started using uh, in, in general. And, and the idea is really, uh, why shouldn't you be able to wear all of your achievements on some kind of, uh, on, not a vest or anything, but online, obviously, but have some form of, of collecting them, organizing them, determining who you're going to show them to. But it's in your space, and those are all your achievements. And those achievements, could be anything we've done that you care about. It could be, you know, I've taught piano to my to my niece, and she's now a great pianist. Or it could be I studied law at uh, uh, at Yale, or you know, uh, whatever it is uh, the achievement that is is, val is is valuable to you. If there's a way to recognize it, why uh, shouldn't we give you the tools uh, to kind of uh, aggregate them and communicate them to other people? And online, that would obviously look a little bit different. Um, and this is just a, a, a mock-up that we're working on with Mozilla, um, where we are actually building, so we're a little further along here than, than, uh, than I, I might have made it sound. We're building an open infrastructure for badges, where any organization could become a badge issuer and publish badges into this infrastructure. And uh, users would be in control, their badges are tied to them at, through their ID that they use online, and they could control who gets to see those badges, they could move them to their blog. Uh, in the next stage, they could display them in LinkedIn or in Facebook. Um, but the infrastructure that moves those badges around is completely open and anyone can participate. And um, the validity of the badge really rests with the issuer. So the infrastructure doesn't put any requirements on the issuer in terms of how you issue those badges. Um, and so this university would be, would be one issuer um, for these badges. Um, I think I'm at the end of here, yeah. So I think, I don't know, that, that was kind of a, a huge amount of stuff that I tried to cover fairly quickly so we have time to discuss. But if any of it was uh, not clear, it would be great if we, you know, I'm happy to go back to any of these pieces and drill down into more detail. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to the, to the conversation. <coughs> Thank you. Gary's been discussed. There's some um, snacks. Sometimes I put on after lunch, sometimes before lunch. This is during lunch. <laughs> uh, first, I want to say something about Philip. An extraordinary individual. He lives in a, right in the center of the world. It's called South Africa. And uh, he, uh, he's a, uh, almost everywhere, all the time. I don't know how he does it. Uh, that's one thing. I think uh, you mentioned UCI's involvement. Uh, I think the main thing I, I 
helped him with was uh, to tell him about Ambien. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> basis, uh, that, that you you actually it. gave me one. I gave him one. <laughs> <laughs> I got a pair of badge and said I could give you one. Uh, but uh, he's incredible. He, you know, he, he, he interacts with people with a coat and tie and hair, gray hair falling out, but he also uh, operates with people just as easily who have torn t-shirts and orange hair uh, put into a mohawk. So he's uh, it's extraordinary. The, the, the way he's put this whole thing together is extraordinary. And the people, the four or five or six people that really started with him uh, are, are also extraordinary <coughs> people. And he's given actually voice to what, what I just learned this last summer, something I hadn't heard about before, the edupunk. Anybody heard, heard, heard the word edupunk? Yes, a couple people. These, these are folks who not only do not want to go to a, uh, a, a formal educational experience as offered by a university, but actually aggressively uh, seek ways to go around it and, and, and do their own education. And the uh, peer-to-peer university is, is that sort of link between the structure and the non-structured world that really has to be made. And uh, so Peer to Peer University is doing a great job of that, and it's in a very experimental space. Uh, one of the things that uh, Peer to Peer University is doing is something that happened that we found out in 2001 when we did our first uh, Hewlett grant on learning repositories. In that, even in that early stage, we found out that the whole the whole world of open courseware and open repositories was supply side oriented. That in fact, users were not being consulted at all. People were putting up open courses and just doing whatever they wanted. And guess what? Nobody was using it because really the users hadn't been had, had not been consulted. Uh, what's happened over these years is that we began to incorporate, first slowly and now more aggressively, the notion of users into the whole idea of the open world, the open educational world. The peer to peer university represents really a, a, an extension of that whole idea, that we want users to actually decide what they're going to learn and then go about learning it in a kind of a learning co-op. We have a, a sort of a learning co-op, I see Peggy here, we have a sort of a learning co-op here at, at uh, UCI called the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. So that is a group of people who get together, decide what they want to learn, and then acquire, get the learning resource they need, and then uh, get a lecture. Well, this is the same sort of thing that same notion, peer-to-peer -peer university has got a version of that same notion, and it's really a learning co-op. From, from my perspective, from continuing education, uh, again, we, we see this from a slightly different aspect than most people in the university do, because we've been serving people who are busy working adults who want their education in convenient forms. They don't want to have to drive on the freeway for 45 minutes each way if they can help it. They want it uh, at whatever time they can get it, and so if they, they're, when they're, after the kids are in bed. So we've been trying to fulfill the, the notion of convenience in, in education. And also, our people are very sophisticated users of, of continuing education. They already have degrees. And so generally, uh, they know what they want. They want it at, in the most convenient and quickest way. They have an opportunity cost for all of their time. And so this notion of openness has also served, uh, served our, our audience and, and our perspective. We have. In, in higher education, for instance, often, uh, frequently, well, I'm sorry, we have already established a, a process by which learning can be validated by challenge tests, or even we can give credit for life experiences in, in some institutions. And this is the kind of notion of extending the learning, uh, of redefining the learning space, not only to university level subjects and formal education, but well beyond. Uh, those uh, those kinds of experiences that we offer so prominently here at UCI. So we have it. Peer to peer university is really in that same uh, kind of tradition, although it also uh, extends that tradition quite uh, dramatically. Just to, just one quick notion: the UCI Open Courseware site. Uh, we have Adriana Amestis and Larry Cooperman, who are really the people who are putting this have been putting this together. We now, I would say, we are second only to MIT in terms of the institutional expression of open courseware. We are a distant second. Uh, they have 
2,000 courses. We have maybe 52 or 55 courses. Uh, but we're getting there, and when you look at uh, what other people are doing, we're, as I say, I think we're a distant second. Uh, we now have 30,000, about 30,000 visits a, a month to our uh, courseware site. We have 52 courses up, we have over 70 videos up, and uh, we're extending the idea of open courseware in, in many directions. One of which Philip mentioned, which is the notion of granting or, or doing a learning assessment in certain areas such as continuing professional education. This is where, where we're really excited about uh, our partnership with Peer to Peer University. This is an experiment in, in a formal, um, well-established Research One University trying to make connections with the learners of the world who need the kind of services that we can provide from this university, which is validation of learning experiences, putting learning experiences into the proper context, that is the formal context of, as we recognize it, and for those who want it, giving them the certification that they need to fulfill their motives. And that's basically what continuing education really is, is all about. That's why we're doing it. But it's also wonderful to be in the same innovative space with, um, with these kind of cutting edge, very experimental uh, uh, efforts, such as Perry Perry University. We will, we will be doing, as, as Philip said, we'll be doing some things with peer-to-peer -peer university material, but we're also doing those same kind of things with material that have been produced by our own faculty through videotapes, through video lectures and so forth. We're beginning to get the, the uh, notion of putting uh, learning assessments inside video, video presentations and then providing a certificate of, of uh, completion or a certificate of learning to those folks who have taken, taken the, that learning, uh, seen that videotape, taken that uh, learning test, and, and uh, satisfied the learning requirements of the thing. So we're, we're doing this and a few other things to try to uh, uh, serve in this experimental state, this space that, uh, that Philip has described. And so again, I wanna, again, I wanna close by really validating and really congratulating Philip on what he has done. Frankly, Two years ago, when I heard about P2P, I thought, this is a non-starter. This is not going to go anywhere. And, and uh, I certainly, certainly thought about that as I began to see what was happening. But, but it was really, it's really been pulled together wonderfully. And um, more, more support has been coming through, and more money has been coming through. And so we're, we're now very excited about uh, seeing the, what, what happens next. And, and we're, I'm pretty much convinced that this is this going to live and continue to, to grow and prosper. We're very happy to be associated with it. Philip Mauer. Hi, thanks for um, inviting me to, to comment on this. And, and thank you, Philip, for that introduction. I spent some time over the weekend taking a look at the, the website and some of the courses and some of the material. Um, and it was very helpful to get your, your framing just now. Um, I'm kind of a curmudgeon, so I just want to say that right up front. And I'm also um, the sort of professor that generally doesn't allow my lectures to be videoed, to be videoed and posted um, for a bunch of reasons. I mean, one of the reasons, I think, is because for me, the classroom, even the large lecture hall, is really a dramaturgical space where I'm trying to get the students to do various things and think in certain ways not just on a one-off kind of here's today's lecture, I will now give you content and then it starts again, but over the course of an extended conversation during a quarter, um, it's very difficult for that kind of a thing to be excerpted on YouTube. So that, that's another sort of disclosure. Um, and a few other um, disclosures as well. I've sort of been thinking um, in the past couple of weeks about a couple of things that have been happening in the world. The Huffington Post deal, um, where um, free crowdsourced content all of a sudden became $300 million, um, not shared out to any of those folks. Um, the, the peculiar kind of investment decisions around Facebook that are taking place, where um, we can have a kind of investor-driven capitalism, but the investment opportunities for Facebook are closed to JP Morgan and 30 special people. Um, so it's not the kind of open model of anybody can be a shareholder. Anybody can be a shareholder of IBM or Intel, but not Facebook. Um, and then finally, for my own particular kind of 
cranking this whole show, in this weekend's redesign of the New York Times Magazine, where the letter <laughs> section um, changed from being letters to being reply all. Um, so that, that just all of which is to say, you know, um, I, 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 I appreciate the um, I, I appreciate the kind of experimental quality um, of what's being proposed here, but I want to try to push um, a bit and be a little bit um, provocative um, in my comments today here. Um, and I should say another kind of, you know, in the interest of disclosure, both in the practical work that I do with the institute that I direct and in my research activity, I'm really, really, really committed to and interested in the idea of user-driven innovation um, and the, the kind of user-driven movement of various larger scale systems um, out there in the world, including education. But then I start to wonder at what point we, can, we can't equate scholarship with content, and we can't equate, say, being a professor with being a thought leader. Um, so I've got kind of th three big sort of things to say. The, the first is, um, is there virtue in things that are closed as opposed to open? Um, what I'm thinking about is the way that there are very different notions of openness um, that are in this project and in a lot of projects like this that get kind of collapsed together. And I'm not entirely sure that that's always helpful. Um, so we've got kind of the openness of open source and open code, openness in terms of access, openness in proprietary terms indexed by things like Creative Commons, and then openness um, in terms of decision making and governance. Um, we're, we're using the same word for each one of those things. Each one of those things I think has very different work to do. Um, maybe works well with certain kinds of educational missions, maybe doesn't work so well um, with others. And I'm thinking about, you know, when I sort of say, is there virtue in things that are closed? I'm thinking about, um, how difficult it is to have this kind of conversation about this kind of experiment in um, such a heavily socially mediated um, context where even though kind of openness in the sense of provisionality um, is touted as, as a value, it's not really allowed. Since if everything's open, everybody can tweet about this, I'm gonna self-censor in ways that I wouldn't if I knew that this was a safe space of a closed classroom um, outside of which, you know, we, we don't um, necessarily share, unless you've done the work, unless you've done the homework, unless you've done the readings, right? I don't want you dipping into my class, say, when I'm trying to get an evangelical student to take a pro-stem cell research position um, to test the limits of their thinking and their comfort zone. They're not gonna be comfortable having that, you know, discussed outside. Um, and I'm not gonna be comfortable asking them to do that kind of activity if it is open in the sense of, of no walls. Um, and you know, this kind of makes me think about the, the history of the university and um, why there are walls. Um, the history of things like the debate over academic freedom, which sets up walls to protect so that there can be crazy thinking going on here that doesn't offend the community with pitchforks, the donors, the government, um, the market, whatever. So. You know, if everything is open, does this close down certain kinds of, of debate and discussion? And another way of asking it is, would this model work with the humanities and social sciences, um, where by definition our subject matter is highly controversial and highly charged, um, and, and you know, gets us into trouble enough with the walls, so without the walls we'd be getting into even more trouble. Um, the, the next thing I wanted to, to raise is um, and this gets to the kind of Huffington Post sort of thing, is um, how do we think about how this works in terms of a world structured by the market? And you know, another way I could put this is what kind of capitalism does this work with or against? Um, and I think it works both with and against. I don't want to be, you know, say it's all just you know, neoliberalism or something. Um, but I want to think about that a bit. So we have this interesting kind of contradiction on the one hand of of um, you know, Chris Anderson's book free and crowdsourcing um, and openness on the one hand, um, but then that's often paired with closed ownership structures on the other. Um, Facebook is the example, right? Um, you know, from a, wearing a sort of hat of a government regulator, something like Facebook starts to look an awful lot like a public utility, 
if it's being used for so many important functions, for communicative and other functions, um, for people. If it's starting to appear to be a common carrier or a public utility, like the interstate road system or something like that, then you know how should how should we think about that kind of thing? Should perhaps ownership um, be open? And this, this gets to the whole question of sort of ownership and things like Creative Commons licensing and how awkwardly they sit um, in the current moment with the kind of market structures that we live in. Um, to say nothing of you know the university's place um, within those sorts of, of market structures. So um, that's my kind of you know what kind of capitalism is the peer peer university adequate to? And then the, the, the last thing I want to raise here um, has to do with, in a way, the brand, um, the branding here by using the term university. And what kind of value added does the notion of university still have? Um, that's really intriguing to me, and I think potentially quite interesting if this experiment can be used to push some of the boundaries of that brand, so to speak, in new directions. Um, toward you know, various forms of user innovation without tearing down all the walls or eliminating all of the ownership. Um, I, I'm interested, too, with this link to the, the notion of the university. And the university, I mean, to me, uh, I have this very old-fashioned kind of sense of university about being about kind of universal knowledge, right? And the sort of, the university is this sort of big, big um, Thing where even sort of arcane knowledge can exist and even impractical knowledge um, can exist. There, there's an interesting um, thing here too for me with the notion of peer, because we've also got at least two very different notions of peer um, going on in academia and in some of these digital mediated um, learning spaces. Peer, in the sense of peer to peer, as on the one hand kind of all of us, anybody, right, a sort of collaborative, kind of sharing kind of world. But then the, the peer in peer review, which is the hallmark of an academic discussion, isn't really like that, right? The peers in peer reviews are, they're a kind of community of equals, but not really, there is hierarchy. There's often anonymity or confidentiality, so your work is reviewed by a group of your peers, but you don't get to know who they are, and in, with a good peer review system, they don't get to know who you are either. And that's the, the kind of system that creates you know, our equivalent of, of badges, so to speak, that authorizes the kind of knowledge that we produce. Again, even if that knowledge is impractical, arcane, of no current relevance, we still have this process of peer review to say, we may not, you know, the market, the government, whoever, may not care one whit for uh, name something the humanities that, that they want to get rid of. Right, I mean, just fill in the blank. Medieval French literature, sorry. <laughs> but, but you know, here we pull together the peers in that field, or we can speak to it in an intelligent way, and you know, they've given it their kind of warrant. Um, it's interesting that in, in, and this is more of a sort of question, it's interesting that in, in P2PU that the U is there, um, and I want to know what kind of badging work that U does um, in this kind of experiment. And, um, you know, do you need it, do you not need it, um, what does it do? Could it, could it really be um, a university in the sense of universal knowledge where, again, even the arcane is, is allowed in? Um, so, you know, I, again, I, I, I say this in, to, to, as a sort of friendly provocation, um, but these are the sort of things that have been bugging me lately, and um, this provides me an occasion to think about those things a bit more deeply through this um, really quite, quite fascinating experiment. So I'll be interested to, to talk some more about this. Uh, we're, we're open for discussion. Uh, you can uh, direct your comments or questions uh, at any of the three speakers. And, uh, Philip is obviously here. Must learn to field them all. <laughs> but, Gary, uh, yeah. I just want to, I'm a research lover in here. I, I took a peer-to-peer -peer university class with Becca on uh, cyberpunk literature. Cyber wonderful. Yeah. The first one? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Right. Thank you. And? Oh, I thought it was perfect. No grades. Uh, <laughs> uh, which is what a lot of us really are looking for, an experience we can learn from without some autocratic, you know, judgment being placed on our efforts. 
Philip, how did you come up with the name P2P? I, I understand it's peer to peer, but are you using mostly the asynchronous model or is it both synchronous and asynchronous? Uh, it's both synchronous and asynchronous, but we don't really, uh, like we tell people what the tools are that they could use, uh, and then they, <coughs> some of the courses are more asynchronous because people are very distributed. But uh, the name uh, is like, a lot of us come from the computer world, so peer-to-peer -peer file sharing is kind of, we thought of, you know, that structure of knowledge sharing maybe. Um, an interesting comment about the, the branding. Uh, so, at the at the moment when we chose it, I would say zero thinking went into choosing the name. Uh, it just someone threw it out, and everyone else went, "Yeah, that's, that sounds cool." Um, and since then, it's been really interesting to see the reactions because I, I think it's actually worked really well for us because it creates that tension in people's minds. I think also in the project. Um, between uh, this thing that's peer-to-peer, -peer, that's very kind of part of this new world, whatever that looks like, and then this you know, old traditional uh, term that is, has so much, uh, holds so much, um, kind of people have such associations with it, and kind of to have those, those two together actually works quite well because you know, we, we are interested in those questions. We don't, I don't think we, we necessarily know the answers. But. Yeah. Um, two kind of related things, both in a, in a way infrastructural at two different levels. One, I just had a question about the badges, whether you've already considered um, a mechanism for cryptographic authentication of them, so that a particular certifier you know, can say that this person really did receive this thing, and you know, if not, you should, and it's fairly simple to do at the technical level, but there's, you know, there should be a standard about how that's done. Um, but the second thing, uh, was your respondent's um, point about what I, I take broadly to be this problem of walled gardens, where you know community content is perhaps being co-opted in the Huffington Post case, and most certainly Facebook is a prominent walled garden where you know contributed content becomes closed. But I also think of a bit older one. There's this very negative example of um, Internet Movie Database, which you know is a widely used site and started out purely as user content, but under these kind of sneaky guidelines where they could then ultimately close it all and, you know, proprietarize it. And I wonder from a, like a charter point of view, I mean, from a, a legal point of view, what you've done to make sure that there's no such threat in the future for your project. Um, yeah, I'd actually like to respond to it. Um, because I think there was some, so I was very happy um, so obviously I like the fact that Gary thinks we're great, but the, the, like I was really happy about your question because uh, for some, some are really questions that we're struggling with and it's good to kind of get more perspective on that. And, and sorry, this is just kind of a roundabout way to come kind of back there. Um, but also because I think some of the uh, tension that you're feeling about PQ is more to do with our inability to articulate what exactly it is that we're doing. So. For example, the, the Facebook uh, comparison and the kind of capitalism that would work with peer-to-peer universities. So it, it is absolutely impossible that any peer-to-peer -peer university's content will ever be closed off. Because uh, whatever is put on the side is licensed under uh, CC by SA. So every, every user has the right to take everything and put it on their own, own website. We, we have no control over what they do with it, uh, except that if they do uh, follow-on works, they also have to license them openly. So we're, we're not only giving everyone access to the materials, we're actually almost forcing them to reopen whatever they do with them as well. So it's uh, very difficult. So, well, so first of all, legally it's impossible to take the content and close it. Uh, secondly, we've um, set up, uh, we had a discussion about should we incorporate as a for-profit or not, not for-profit. We incorporate it as a not-for-profit um, and I have to say, it, against my um, uh, preference, because it is so much work uh, to do it, um, but the reason why we ended up doing it is because two things. One is it's easier to cement a commitment to openness in the non-for-profit uh, structure, 
And secondly, the perception issues around for-profit, where um, it's just, there's something, like it could go the wrong way, and, you know, and Mozilla is a good example. They have a for-profit, <coughs> for profit that makes a huge amount of money, but it is wholly owned by a not-for-profit that makes sure that they never do anything uh, like the Huffington Post deal with Firefox, right? So, um, so yeah, we, I mean, so we definitely, uh, so for me, openness is, I think, uh, uh, goes beyond uh, just having the content online and, and, and possibly building some business model into it. Um, yeah, did I? And the cryptographic thing, uh, so Mozilla is, is really, on the technology side, Mozilla is leading the badge infrastructure development. They've decided against it so far. Uh, so the, the um, it basically a badge is just an XML blob, uh, JSON actually. But, um, and it says uh, who's the identity of the person that has it, who gave it, and what's the URL that, that provides some form of evidence. But then it's kind of up to you, up to the application developers to figure out ways to build authentication into this and, and you know, all of those trusted networks. Um, there isn't currently kind of a signing uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of the actual tokens that can send around. But the URL points to the, the certifier essentially. Exactly. The certifier yeah. is free to publish a list of exactly. Exactly. Uh, I've been trying to think about uh, some of the conceptual implications of the model. I was struck by your phrasing that within any decision, we always opt for experimentation of our structure. And uh, it, it made me think of uh, Ryan Barker's experimental systems, <coughs> um, which comes out of the sciences, but which is a paradigm of a kind of future-oriented learning where um, uh, people are studying something of which the implications and the outcome are not quite known yet, so it's a form of anticipatory knowledge. And in this concrete case, I see it also as a, as a new type of, of cyborg learning, uh, because I think we have to look at the agency of the web uh, it's almost like it's a, it's a, the learning unit is the humans who use it plus the web, and they kind of co-evolve together in a direction that might not be totally clear yet. And um, my, my question in, in this sense is, um, what about unintended consequences? kind of blowback of the model, you know, the, the unintended um, effects. And some of them, I think, still uh, already voiced. Are there concerns about uh, how the model might be uh, appropriated for less benign <coughs> concerns or used uh, for more capitalist uh, profit-oriented uh, ways and all kinds of things. But also, for me, it's also questions about what you will call the per performativity of the classroom, the face-to-face, -face, the ethics of the face-to-face. -face. There's so many uh, implications in that direction. So I wonder if there's any thinking going into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is definitely. So, I think there there are two things that I, I also wanted to make sure that they don't um, that people didn't get the perception that, that, that it was not intent. So we have no intent to tear down all the walls of the existing universities or get rid of the universities. Uh, we, many of us went to university. It was a great experience for many different reasons. I think one key one that is often underestimated or not uh, at least mentioned or communicated enough is just the socialization aspect of spending, like leaving your family, spending four years in a cohort of people in the same age. I think that is a hugely important aspect that almost no one talks about these days. It's all about innovation and, and you know, the, uh, those things. So we have no intention to get rid of the university. And we have no intention to get rid of or have kind of low appreciation of the role of the great professor. Right, the, the, the person that can hold a conversation over an entire three-month period. 
that can get people's mind, like set uh, uh, learners' minds on fire. Uh, like those individuals <coughs> are fantastic, and uh, we appreciate them just as much as I think everyone here. Um, the, the the I guess the point we're trying to make is just that is just a tiny slice of learning that happens, and the, the the kind of learning that people have access to. Right? I mean, how many of these uh, uh, people have we learned uh, under? Uh, how, how many people can really spend four years to go to an institution like UC Irvine? Uh, you know, just the, the capital investment. So there's all this other learning that's out there that, that I think is is valuable, and maybe as valuable as what happens in the university. So I think that's more the Pitt University story. But um, to come back to your question about are we worried about a certain things? So. I'm not worried at all about the capitalist uh, concerns here because it's the project is set up in a way that it, the community will always have ownership. Of it. So I mean, maybe there is a way to undermine it, which I'm not aware of. But there's certainly no built-in backdoor for the people who are involved to kind of appropriate it in any way. Like there, I, I am not aware of any possibility for me to even do that. Um, so I'm not worried about the capitalist uh, kind of influence on, on what's going on. I'm worried about the capitalist influence of the job market, right? That there will be more demand for courses that are job uh, skills and people will get jobs and, and less demand for courses uh, that are um, kind of not so aligned with the job market. But the, that your comment actually <coughs> gave me a lot of hope because the cyberpunk course is the perfect example of a course that has very little relevance, or at least in direct terms, to the to, to the job market. Uh, but it's a fantastic course, and so the fact that we have those courses and hopefully we'll have many more of them, I think, is is great. And I would almost argue that it's easier to have a course like that at Peter University than at UC Irvine, uh, where there you have committees that approve. And so you know maybe there's more room for that kind of uh, positive experimentation in terms of content. What really worries me is that people come and use uh, Pitt University to promote certain uh, extremist points of views, right? So, um, and we don't have great mechanisms to defend against that right now. Uh, so, uh, I, I, so I can imagine a valuable course on any topic, right? As long as it looks at all the different perspectives and it is a, a kind of tries to really understand what are the important questions and, and tries to get at them and understand all the different facets of it. And, and, um, but the, the reality is that there are many topics where uh, the, unless the course is really well done, it's a danger, it would be um, a harmful topic, I would say. And we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what's the language we could use to say this course is in and this course is out. And we haven't found it. The best we've found at this point is if one course would discredit uh, all the other courses. So if one course, whatever the content of that course is, would bring down all the others, we reserve the right to, to not run it right now. Uh, but, I, but the reason why we're struggling with this, I think to some degree, is that the community is still too small. So to have this kind of filtering and community review, you just need many more people. Um, in, in the same way that Wikipedia, uh, you know, their quality control is very good because they have thousands of people reading every change that comes through the pipeline. And it's very easy to detect uh, a bad change and to revert it. Whereas for us, we don't have thousands of people who, who review all the courses. So I am really worried about people trying to undermine the whole project by running a course that denies the Holocaust, for example. There's a, there's a distinction to be made, I think, between the disposition of inquiry and the disposition of propagation. Right? Yes. And, and if one can find mechanisms for pushing a disposition of inquiry and for um, undermining or refusing a disposition of propagation um, as its principle of identity. I just want to point uh, out, you know, point out one thing that Bill had mentioned that he was having trouble finding institutional sponsors, particularly higher education institutional sponsors of the funding for a peer to peer university. And we we were able to use Hewlett funding to support uh, P2PU uh, with Hewlett as a write-in. And Hewlett spe specified they wanted to use it that way. But there, there was a several issues that we had to get cleared up. And 
And one of them was not only the, the really bad course or the course that taught something not very good, but the notion of, okay, it's perfectly, it's probably logical, maybe, on current period period, to have a course on astrology, or how to read the racing form, or something like that, which is not something the university wants to be associated with. Uh, but we, we felt that because of the structure and how it was a separate organization and so forth, that we were, we were insulated enough from, from, that kind, from that kind of criticism that, that uh, we were okay. But it goes back to what Professor Mara said about, okay, what, what is a university? We've got a university in our title, <coughs> we have the university in their title. Are, are, is there some sort of crossover sort of verification or, or credibility that we're lending by our association in some way? But as I say, we, we were able to work that out with our folks. The way things are going, we might need the racing folks sooner than we know it. I'd like to ask a question about validation. Because it, it seems to me that uh, you know one of the uh, inspirations of this new kind of university is to teach and learn uh, something that works even if it's not validated. Uh, in contrast to uh, uh, getting a validation for things that don't even work. You know, like, like your example about learning computer science, you get a degree for it, and then you, know, you can't put it together. Right? Uh, the, um, so it seems that, I mean, the university, uh, you know, the, the formal university uh, has many functions, but one of its main functions, it seems, is to validate. Uh, to give a validation for a certain kinds of knowledge. Which is uh, the question I want to raise is um, uh, whether you, you know, this idea of, uh, of a peer to, uh, peer to peer you, uh, can it do without a, a notion of validation? I know you get back to it. I mean, it, it it's something that's very important uh, in, in your presentation. <coughs> That seems to me to, to be, uh, um, this is a question, to be slightly contradictory. Because uh, the whole point of, the, of a peer-to-peer -peer university is to teach what works uh, even though it's not validated. It's like, you know, it's like for example, the, um, the relationship of museums or biennials uh, to, the, to the artwork that, that's being produced. I mean, one of the functions of a museum, though there are great artworks in museums, right? but one of its functions is that it validates whatever is, is put into it. Right? But, um, but if, what is new about your idea of a, of a PPP university is to focus on that which are quality in, in a sense. Right? So it's, it's not like giving up quality control. I mean, you, you have to sort of uh, uh, keep at that. But quality control is not the same as validation. So um, what I'm asking is, could you take a stance, like say, you know, we are not going to give any validation. No badges. <laughs> right? I mean, you, you do this, but it, uh, because it's based on these very different uh, principles of, of teaching and learning. Because otherwise, I think the confusion and, uh, would, would set it. And I mean, the question is, <coughs> in what way is this university different from another university? And that's why I think the question about why you call it a university. Um, so, um, I think that I would like to tie the notion of validation to community. The, 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 well, I think it's always tied to community. And so, like, so some community de determines uh, what are its uh, accepted practices and behaviors and, and, and what it uh, values. And then it has some mechanism of validating actions or works that, are, that conform or don't conform. So it won't be a patch. Well, it the could be a patch. It could validation. be, I mean, it could be, uh, you know, like the, if someone learns to be a carpenter, yeah. the, you know, the, yeah. they, they could get a badge. But it, it's based on the behaviors that carpenters are supposed to display and the skills that they're supposed to have. But the carpenter community knows exactly what that means. 
Now, the thing is, I think where PP is different from, from other institutions, and I think the, the question with institution versus community comes in is that uh, institutions tend to uh, create structures where those things that are valid are much more fixed, whereas in communities, I would argue they are more in flux. And so we would, I, I, I don't have a problem with validation. It, I just think that the process of um, determining what is valid needs to be open. And I, I don't think the process is open enough right now in many institutional educational settings where <coughs> the web, de web development is an uncontroversial example because it simply moves too slowly. The process of validating uh, is just not uh, adequate for the technology it's trying to validate. In the humanities, I don't, I'm not so familiar, but I'm sure there are some issues around determining what is valid and what is not, uh, where uh, structural um, uh, processes get in the way of the communi of communities. Uh, kind of, there must be some tension somewhere. Um, so I think as a project peer to university, the only things we could validate is uh, behavior that conforms with peer learning. And so we could validate that you are a good peer learner and you collaborate with others, you share knowledge, you reflect on other people's contributions, those are things we could validate. We can't validate uh, skills or competencies in certain topic areas because we, we are not, that's not our, we are not that community. So what we're trying to do is we work with other communities, so with Mozilla. With the web developer community can validate web developer knowledge and behavior. And we are just a conduit into that community. Uh, and I think that's a mechanism that that can is interesting uh, for us, uh, and it, it kind of deals with that tension that you described, uh, where you don't want to fall in the in the old trap uh, of fixing everything and, and kind of having these rigid rules. But at the same time, there is also demand for valid, some form of validation. I think it can be part of learning as well. I mean, like to get feedback on, you know, are you progressing in a certain direction that that community has determined is is the the valid direction, I guess. Um, does that is that does that make sense? Makes sense. You're gonna yes. come yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're gonna come back in. I know. Um, three quick things uh, I'm Tom Belstor from the anthropology department. Thanks for that. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Three quick things um or things I think it'd be important to respond to. It, it's awesome that it's Creative Commons license and it's nonprofit and that protects you. But right now in, this, in Wisconsin, they're talking about a 50% defunding of the universities. We're talking about huge defunding of the university system here in California and elsewhere. And the right-wing forces who are behind that, in many ways, I could see them loving to get access to your PowerPoint. But you talk about the system is fundamentally broken, and there's an iron triangle, and there's these pictures of the sad students sitting alone in the lecture room rather than some lonely person in the basement with their computer. And is there a way that you could reframe this that doesn't have to be so antagonistic to the university system, particularly because you're using the term at precisely this moment when the university system is under such attack? Even though I don't think it's your intention, I think this is completely co-optable by the right as an idea that the university system is broken, there's an iron triangle, what do you do with iron? Even with that metaphor, you melt it, right? You can't reshape it. Um, so you must melt the triangle and remelt it into this peer-to-peer -peer thing that's going to save us a lot of money at the same time and get rid of all these pesky unions and, and these faculty and do all that. And I know that's not your intention, yeah. but just having Creative Commons and being nonprofit does not insulate you from that problem because it's in the way that you're framing it as antagonistic to the university form. And universities are messed up, I know that for sure. But can there be ways that this could be seen as part of strengthening universities, which I think is your intention? And to build on that, it's striking that in this whole conversation, there's not one word, not one word about research. So that university is completely conflated with teaching. And I think this is where I'm scholarship with content. And so one thing I think it's interesting to think about is that the value of universities isn't just about teaching. There are spaces of research where new ideas and concepts and things are created that then you can teach people about. And it might not be the part of, of a kind of peer-to-peer -peer thing to do that work, but the conflation of the university with learning, I think, is problematic because there's also research and actually service. And peer-to-peer -peer stuff could be awesome for service and community engagement. But the research piece, I think, I would love to see more on. And then the last point to build up to this, I do research in Second Life on virtual worlds. I think virtual stuff is awesome. 
But I think there's a real confusion in the way that you frame stuff about the peer-to-peer -peer thing as a mode of pedagogy versus something linked to the internet. Because a lot of what you're talking about, you could, as an experiment, do totally in meat space, right? It wouldn't have to be online at all. And then you could have online stuff that's totally hierarchical and uses the standard or whatever. And you know this already. But, but in terms of the framing, and perhaps as a way to do a kind of rhetorical framing of the project that isn't so hostile towards the university system, to, to disaggregate a bit which aspects of this are cyber-specific versus which aspects of this link to broader conversations about sort of rethinking pedagogy more generally, because at points in your presentation I got confused between those two. Um, <laughs> so, uh, obviously you're absolutely right that we would have no intention of being corrupted by the guy that's trying to shut down the universities. Um, but I am, and I'll, 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 I'd be interested to think more about how we can reframe the message in, in a way that uh, avo avoids that danger. But I also do uh, struggle, I think, to, to some degree with that because some things are fundamentally broken. And one has to be able to say it. And I think the, the cost of content, for example, is completely broken. Like the amount of money that people pay for textbooks, especially in the US, makes absolutely no sense when we've already paid for that with, with taxes and, you know, over and over again. Uh, and the same with research output. So to kind of tiptoe around that, I think also defeats the purpose of, of really wanting to change it. Right? So I'd love to find a better balance between the two. And, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, as I said before, I, I don't want to get rid of the university, and I think the, especially things that are not market related should get public funding in the universities. Uh, but um, I guess the, the the things we are seeing as opportunities would play into that into those arguments to some degree. Um, research, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we we're not. Uh, I guess. It comes back to this branding uh, thing that you call it a university, you create certain expectations. We, we don't do research, uh, and research is a crucial and fundamental uh, role of the university. Some universities do more of it than others. Uh, we do none. Um, so, I don't know, I guess I, the, the, for me, the, the idea of the university maybe is a little more about a community of people who are just interested in sharing knowledge. Uh, and not so tied to a, a particular, and I mean, I guess I would like also to come back to, to some of the comments earlier. I mean, there are different ways of reading the history of the university, right? Uh, th there is the kind of uh, the safe space where we can think about everything ideal, which I would argue in most cases uh, it was much more, I mean, the Humboldt University is the perfect example. It was designed to create a common culture that could then be exported back into the regions of Germany to hold the nation together. So it was the exact opposite of trying to you know, mm -hmm. encourage wide, wide thinking <coughs> and freedom. And yet we still refer to the Humboldt University often as kind of the, the, uh, one of the founding ideas of the university. Same with the religious uh, history of the universities in the UK, where you know, it's the exact opposite of, of free thinking. So, um, I mean, I, I think that the, the ideal of the university is that, that we probably share. Uh, isn't so closely connected to the reality either. And so I guess I want to defend Future University a little bit in the sense that, yeah, we also don't really totally fit with that ideal, but maybe we, we don't fit in other ways. Um, and the technology link, so that's a little surprising to me. I think that there is something fundamentally different about technology. You're absolutely right that peer learning has nothing to do with technology per se. Like we, this, this is peer learning. In some, in some ways. But there is something new about technology yeah. in that it has kind of break, broken down these barriers <coughs> and also let us create these, these new forms of collective and collaboratives that we couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just much easier to do that and, and we're kind of seeing it at a scale that, that it wasn't possible before. So I think for us it's important. Maybe we should, be, so I guess the, the point I'm, I'm really taking very seriously from your comments is we do need to go back and look at the messaging and communication very carefully, uh, because we are playing into kind of different potential. Uh, I would argue misunderstandings, but you know that that would you know who cares if it's a misunderstanding? Someone takes the idea and, and, and runs with it, um, 
and, and that, it, the, the, that that could potentially be dangerous. So uh, thank you very much for those comments. Uh, at the back of the room. Um, uh, thank you so much for this talk. I, I, I relate to a lot of these anxieties that I'm hearing today because I, I'm actually going to teach my first online course this summer. And uh, I teach composition. A friend of mine who teaches uh, ethics is also going to be teaching online. And both of these are not content courses. It's not like math or geography or something like that necessarily. And so the actual dramaturgical as aspect, the performative aspect of my classroom matters a lot. And, and I think just based on the last question, the idea of production and dissemination of knowledge, which is often what considered the university, we're getting rid of production and just disseminating knowledge. And last time my friend and I were talking about this, we said, well, you know, is just giving away information in and of itself a value? Is that is there is that a quantifiable value that we could we could think of as being great, you know, and worthwhile, you know, just to give it out there? Or or is the interaction with, with the student um, more important to make sure that they get the knowledge in a, in a particularly appropriate or usable way? And I and I don't know. I don't have I don't I don't know where I fall on this, and I, and I think this is a really great conversation. I don't I don't have an answer, I'm not sure I have a question as much as a, the voice and anxiety that I feel is prevalent in this room, uh, certainly amongst the anthropologists, uh, the humanities, you know, uh, because we don't teach content courses and we need that interaction. Um, but at the same time, I agree, uh, as, as a graduate student in the university system, as a, not as an educator, but as a student for, for quite a while now, that there is something broken here and it's not getting fixed. In fact, if you ask most of my colleagues, we think it's getting worse. Um, we don't see this, this as a sustainable model for, the, for academia. Um, and we don't think it's going to last. Uh, most of my friends are terrified about going to the job market because we just don't even know what sort of job market exists. Um, and so I, I'm really excited about your project because I'm terrified about what's going on with this, this work here. Uh, the, the walls are crumbling, I think so. And, and if we don't figure out something else to do, um, we, we won't have this or that, you know, and maybe we'll only have that. We'll only have the dissemination of knowledge by a few people, and I think that's problematic too. And I guess I guess I'm just scared. <laughs> I guess I'm just really scared of, of this or that, you know. And I think that it, it, it's the collapsing of the two together that that is the only possible uh, avenue we have to look forward to. And and it isn't one or the other. It is. It's going to be the really you know crafty way we bring these two models into one, right? Yeah. And, um, yeah. I'm scared. I actually agree with almost everything you say, um, or maybe everything. But um, so I think it's uh, some things are terrible to learn online. Uh, you know, it just makes it's, it's either impossible or makes no sense to me. And it would be great to do them face to face. I think other things are might be better to learn online, uh, where you just need a more diverse group of people that you can interact with in, in different ways. Um, so, I, as you say, you know, it's, it's not one or the other. Um, with respect to the distinction between content and learning, uh, the, for me, the content is just infrastructure. Like giving away content is is meaningless. But the thing is that the 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 cost of giving it away is so low uh, that you know it, it will be, we, basically it's like it's like oxygen. Like, is there any value in oxygen per se? No. But when you breathe. You know, it becomes very valuable to you. It's the same with content for me. So content is just that stuff that's, that you need to be able to learn. And, but then the learning is the interaction between people. Uh, and and that's, I think that's why it's called peer-to-peer -peer also. Right? It's, like, it's not the content university, it's the peer-to-peer -peer university. The ideal would be that it, you learn through discourse and debate and engaging and being exposed to other ideas. I think that is the... I mean, for me, that has been the most valuable to learn, way to learn for myself. I, I wish that more people have access to that kind of experience. Um, but, yeah, I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about um, your relationship to other open courseware initiatives? Is there tensions between you? Are you working, collaborating with them? Or what's, what's happening in that front? Um, not, not really any tension. I mean, there's... Uh, so we leverage everything that the open courseware movement does. I mean, I, I actually, I, should, I, I sit on the board of the Open Courseware Consortium. So the, that group of institutions has published uh, the numbers <laughs> kind of vary occasionally, but I think somewhere about 12,000 courses. So I've been, uh, like that's, that's where I came from. Like I've been very strongly promoting universities to, to basically give their content away because I didn't think it, the content had the, was the value of the university. So 
we leverage that, those materials, and there's no conflict at all. I think, it, actually, the contrary. I don't think we figured out a way, uh, a good enough way to support the open course we are projects yet. Um, so I think they're totally open to more collaboration, and we haven't really figured out how to do that well. Um, with other open education uh, projects that are not content focused, that are learning focused, so we there are lots of projects that are looking a little bit similar to Pitt University with like slightly different uh, flavors and, and variations. And I think some uh, more offline, for example, which are really interesting, the 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 one that started at the University of California, I think it's the new school or something, where you basically yeah, is it the new school? school? Yeah, you, you submit, you say I want to learn this, they find other people and. Uh, but you do it face to face, so I think that's awesome. Um, and then there are a few other online ones that are a little bit similar. So no, I mean, on one hand, I think the space is so big right now, and also no one really knows what, what's the best way to do it, that uh, it's more collaborative than uh, competitive. Um, and what I have noticed is that almost all the other projects, like Udemy and uh, Super Cool School um, and Edufire, that they are all for profit. And so it's interesting, for, it'll be interesting for me to see, I mean, I think they, for them, they're definitely going after the same kind of money and they're competing for customers. We are kind of pretending that we don't have to do that right now. Um, and we'll see what happens, but I mean, I think, I mean, it's, for, I kind of feel torn about this because I want the project to succeed and do well and grow and be around 10 years from now. But when we started it, we very made it very clear that one of the successes would be that we spectacularly fail, but someone else learns from our failure and does it much better. That that would be, we would define that as success. And so I still feel that way, but at the same time, obviously, I take grant money and I, you know, I try to make, I make promises. I say we're going to grow and we're going to do all these things, and then failure doesn't feel good uh, in that context. But. Um, so you want it both ways? <laughs> we want it both ways, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, just, just as an illustration to your comment, the walls are, are tumbling down. When I go to sit in on lectures here, I sit in the back, and half the students have their laptops open. Uh, some of them never glance up during the entire lecture to see what, what's being visually shown. But, and, and some, of course, are social networking, but, um, but I think a lot of the other ones are actually looking, they're no longer confined by the walls. They're, they're using uh, the web and they're outside the walls and they're looking up either what you're interested in or while you were lecturing, lecturing here, I looked up your course catalog and I looked up the MIT, MIT course catalog on the web uh, just to see what these things were doing. Um, but, um, the conventional lecturers here, uh, you know, it's somewhere, they have, it, it's not, organ, no one knows how to comprehend what's going on. But, and, and the students eventually are voting with their minds as to what sources they want to use. And, and finding anything on the web is very disorganized. It, you never get it at the right level, you never get it organized, integrated, prepared which is the way we evaluate our, our teaching here for those criteria. Um, so it, it's somehow a compromise between these two has to be found. So the students can use web material, but they also have to use the organized, prepared, integrated uh, outlook that their instructor brings to the course. Yeah. Um, two thoughts on this. And one connects back to a, a thought you raised earlier um, is kind of the connection between the, the open and the closed and how do we um, make that work for both. We actually had one course that was taught at a um, university in uh, Japan, Keio University, on journalism, digital journalism. And it was open to peer-to-peer -peer university learners. And um, I've looked around at other people who've done similar things and the overwhelming response of those experiments has been that they improve the experience for everyone involved. The professor, because there's there are more people that are active and kind of bring diverse ideas. The, the students in the institution, because they get feedback from kind of they perform at a. Uh, so I guess there, there is that safe space question, which we I didn't have had time to come back to. And I, it's 
it's, it, it's really interesting. But it's like they perform on a much bigger stage, right? So they get kind of the, it's different. You write a blog post, the whole world can read it, or you write it in Blackboard, and only you or seven people in the class can read it. You, you, and then you get a response from someone. Right? It's an amazing experience, right? So for the students in the institution, I think it's beneficial. Obviously, for the PPU university, it's great because they get access to a university course for free. Um, and the interesting thing in that course was the best work was done not by KO University students, but by PPU students. Um, because they were just, I think, my interpretation is they were so motivated, kind of show that they can also do it. Uh, and the university students were, like, they had to do all these other courses, and they needed to hit whatever, how, you know, they needed the marks. And, so I think there's, there's some, some integration, actually, at the, the learner level that makes sense for, for both. And at the structure and experience and curation level, I, I'm really interested in the notion that the, the, kind of the, the great teacher asks the right questions rather than helps with the right answers. And, and so we, we're trying to find, kind of in, in the courses, we're trying to encourage people to design questions but then let the community figure out the answers themselves because I think it's the key, it's the big questions that you only know once you have looked at something from all the different sides and you've had time to kind of go back at it and reflect and like, you know what are the, the big questions. You might never know the answers, right? But you're, like, you, you've, you're discovering the questions uh, as you uh, gain expertise. At least that's kind of this notion that I'm playing with in my head right now. So, I, I would love, and I think the structure argument works at the question level um, in both worlds very comfortably, or it spans both worlds. It doesn't really work if the, if the curation comes at the answer level, and if like, you, you help people more through that course, which might be necessary in some uh, instances, or I'm sure it's necessary in some instances. But that doesn't, that, I think that works better in the, um, the more structured environments. Yeah. Um, along those same lines, I was thinking about, you mentioned assessment, and so in a more typical view of assessment, you're thinking about uh, a body of knowledge that you want the learners to have, and you're assessing either informally or formally at the end, do they have it, and the instructor's trying to facilitate as they find out you know, what they know, what they don't know, and where they need to get. Um, and what you've done so far, can you elaborate a little bit about what kind of courses you've been working with and, and uh, the questions you're asking yourself and challenges you're facing in creating some sort of assessment instruments that are part of the courses? Did I, did I hear that right, that there were some, yeah. some um, kind of assessment? Larry, maybe you could talk about the, the thing we're doing with the video. Well, <coughs> actually, I'm, just myself. I'm Larry Cooperman. I'm the director of UCI Open Course, where I serve on the Open Course for Consortium with Philip. So whatever I say, I have a conflict of interest uh, talking about it. Um, but uh, we're, we're, well, we look at both our Open Course for Initiative um, uh, and then um, indirectly the peer-to-peer -peer UIT initiative, sort of extensions of the public mission of the university. And so we sort of see it, and I'm sorry I'm prefacing my remarks, but as the ability to create concentric rings around the university give people access to uh, the fantastic work that's done by faculty here, here at UCI. And so we have one, we have these little and technical projects that we were doing to see how can we provide assessment. And you know, sometimes you get continuing education credit uh, by going to a, a meeting, sitting there, and signing a sheet at the end of it. And so whether there's been learning is anyone's guess. Um, so what we're looking at is a, is a uh, technology-based solution to do better than that um, by essentially having somebody actually watch or the, the video lecture, if you will, but actually interact with it. So given HTML5 and JavaScript, and uh, hopefully they'll give me a badge someday, um, you can basically find out where somebody clicked on a video, when they did it, uh, pop-up questions, interactions with uh, uh, a general question, and do an assessment then of whether somebody in their interactions with a specific set of content uh, performed uh, acceptably and, and provides the same kind of continuing education credit that somebody might have otherwise gotten 
simply in a passive fashion sitting there. Yeah, the one thing I would add there is the, I think the input, like that's kind of the transition to the formal environment where I think the, you, you need much, you have much stricter guidelines and, and regulations on how you can do these things. I think within P2P University, we, at this point, we're more interested in assessment for, uh, for learning than assessment of learning. The kind of um, like giving people feedback while they're learning. Um, lots of peer review, uh, basically helping people, using assessment to help people learn rather than to put a stamp on it at the end. We do um, hope to be able to put a stamp on it in terms of the Mozilla badges, but those are also then driven partly by those kind of um, behavioral things. Like you're doing things uh, with a different purpose, like you're building something, you're building a website, and as part of that, like once the website is built, you've succeeded. Um, in a way, that's also assessment, right? But it's it's kind of you. There's some other purpose than the assessment. So you're not you're not writing an exam about building websites at the end. Um, yeah. But, well, there's another interesting thing that we're just experimenting with this a little bit. But but several of our colleagues around the country have found that they can predict um, the success or failure of a particular student in a particular learning object simply by looking at the number of interactions or clicks on the material, how long they stayed there, and, and how often they were on. Absolutely non-academic measures, but very highly predictive of actually completing that course successfully or actually completing the entire degree program successfully. So their, their assessment is becoming a, a little bit sometimes divorced from what we think of as ac academic success. But if you're really interested in predicting success in a particular uh, learning project, <coughs> you, you use all kinds of data. And this is with new technologies now where we can actually track this stuff in a very, very minute way and mine it, data mine it, uh, uh, look at it across thousands of, sometimes thousands of instances, we, we can get a pretty good predictive model of success. And be able to then to prescribe interventions earlier in the process than later in the process. Great, I want to thank oh, I just had one quick question. Sure. You have a nonprofit and you have donors, right? Have you been you've been seeking sponsorships, mm -hmm. investment from the private sector, is that right? No. Not from the private sector, just from foundations. So far, yes. Okay, so back to your question about the marketplace and about what we're doing to deliver people to the demands of the marketplace. Is there room for a private sector investor? to sponsor some aspect of this, either its infrastructure, its content, so that what's driven is delivering to that corporation a specific kind of educated citizen who can be engaged to the, you know, the, the broader. In other words, what is the incentive for someone to sponsor the, 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 the PAP? Yeah. Um, so I think there are. Uh, possibilities to monetize pieces of what P2PU does in a way that wouldn't uh, conflict with its value of openness uh, and freedom. Um, so I think one one aspect could be, which I'm not so interested in, but uh, the, the market of learning management systems that universities uh, use is, is pretty dire, the quality of the software that, that uh, is out there, and that is very, very expensive. So we're building a platform for online peer learning that you know we could provide consulting services around for universities who want to use it. We 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 uh, we could sell it, but it's open source, so you could also just take it and run it. Uh, but we could modify it, or we could give you a white label version to it that you know you could run with your students. We could protect privacy. But that uh, becomes a research activity and service activity. That's a that would be a product service uh, activity. Like we would that would be like the only reason why we would do that is to generate income to support the, the rest of the project. But traditional universities, like they've operated on, they're accredited based on, say, the number of chairs. Like Larry Maurer has a distinguished chair. He's the holder of a chair. And then great graduate students want to come study under him because he is a stellar faculty member producing new knowledge to which great graduate students want to gravitate. And they have an outcome of research and knowledge, right? But this model doesn't really allow for that. As I'm seeing, like the stellar teacher, the Nobel laureate, for example, like Sherry Rowland on this campus is always cited as the exemplar 
uh, somebody who's, yeah, and, and I'm just trying to say, we've always measured ourselves on the quality of our faculty as measured by the number of chairs that private sector invests in, the Wells Fargo chair in. And they typically want something out of it, like they want to deliver business graduates or graduate students who are studying dark particle science and they push the envelope of the origins of the universe with, with what I'm getting at is, where is there room in this model for the sustainability of those kinds of excellences? Sure. Teaching well, or research? So, uh, the model you described, for example, there's no room for that model in the European universities either. Uh, mm -hmm. So, it's a very US uh, centric model, right? Um, but, but not sidestepping the question. That's not how P2PU works, right? So right. Well, maybe it's, like not that's fair to, it's not a fair question. I was just trying to get back to this whole issue of the pedagogy and what it is the value that we're actually seeking for people who, because you mentioned the cyberpunk course, which really was more of an enrichment, right? It uh, was I hope so. Personally enriching, <laughs> but it didn't necessarily qualify for a course credit, didn't necessarily satisfy his employer's requirement that he get continuing education. It was self-enrichment. So what I'm, but, but I'm getting back to like, you. MIT has two, two answers. Yeah. So one is there are lots of things that do not qualify for credit that actually are good for employers. Uh, right. So if they are like the web developer courses, for example, right? right? Like the if you want a good web developer, there's no like what's the university degree you you filter them through? Right. Right? What, what's what, where does the private sector go? The private sector there's no mechanism right now for them. But if you take a course at the School of Web Club, or right, not right now, but let's say by the end of the year, you know, the, the, uh, your trust in the abilities of those people will be higher than for, for an employer, than right. your trust in the ability of someone who just has a university degree in computer science, as a web developer specifically. Um, uh, so I think that's the, that is the one thing. Um, I, I think I lost my train of thought there. But, um, so the other thing is um, maybe that model of funding doesn't make sense for the university, but uh, uh, maybe there are other ways of funding. For, I mean, so I could see a, a, a model where we aggregate, if you've done something in Peter University, you've taken, let's say, seven or eight courses, we help you aggregate everything you've done there in some way that's easy to consume for an employer. And then you decide to show it to an employer, and the employer has to pay for it. Because it gives them trust in your abilities, and you know, it's high, I mean, I don't, hiring people is super expensive because there's such high rates of failure. And so, if we can increase employers' confidence that they're hiring the right people, they're willing to pay a lot of money for that. Obviously, that would have to be controlled by you as the as the learner, not by us. We wouldn't ever sell off someone's data. But if the learner says, "I want to get a job here," and uh, you know, I want you to summarize all this stuff to this employer and the employer is going to pay for it. So maybe that's a business model that could support the nonprofit. Because uh, I, I certainly don't think running after grants is a is a is fun or is a great long term sustainable strategy. Well I was just looking for the case for why a private sector investor would want to sponsor these open work courses. That's what I'm looking for. What is the argument? What's the incentive? Why, why should I invest in the funding? The funding doesn't work, ha happen at the same time. Well, I'm just saying, that's what, yeah. I, I'm actually working on a project right now towards that end. And so I'm looking for a reason why when I make the case or make the presentation. If you took Mozilla out of the equation here and that, that for profit, it's sort of the same thing. I mean, Mozilla, they have, Mozilla has not only a, a, a worldwide idea that they want more web development. There's, there's a model, there's an employment model there. They, yeah. Actually, not, not just an employment model, they actually, yeah, actually, I, uh, thanks Gary, uh, it's the perfect example. Mozilla has a mission, a social mission, to support the open web. So they want to have more people around that understand open web technologies and are open web developers, and they're putting money into providing those training opportunities. So yeah, it's exactly the same. We could, I could make the same argument, let's say, for Greenpeace. They want more people who care about the environment and who can I don't know, start, start a garden or something. And so Greenpeace will put money into training courses and Kitchen University is a you know, very cost efficient way of, of basically spreading that knowledge into a community that then self-perpetuates the learning opportunities. So I guess that, I guess that would well, be... Well, I think the sustainability... I, I, I think we will anyway, thank continue to software. Thank you. Thank uh, you coming to a university near you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>